I love Jesus, but not the church. Have you heard that sentiment before? I love Jesus, but not the church. It seems that we hear this sentiment ever increasingly from the voices of those who've once and and even still profess to believe and follow Christ. Yet due to a variety of factors in varying circumstances, there's been a statistically measurable decrease of physical attendance to and covenantal commitment with the local church. In the present spiritual climate of the West, there's a noticeable souring within people's hearts towards the church. The reasons are varied. It can be as quote unquote small or minuscule as being on the rough end of gossip that ended up hurting someone deeply. And then they ended up giving up on the church. Or it can be as colossal as sexual, spiritual, and or emotional abuse where leaders simply overstep their biblical boundaries of authority. Victims of such sins couldn't help associate the church at large with such despicable, hypocritical leadership that they end up disassociating with the church altogether. And then there are issues on other wavelengths. Individuals begin to distance themselves from the covenant community because they busy themselves with other pursuits, pursuits of career, recreation, or even worldly pleasures. All these things gradually begin to crowd out the once ever so steady commitment to communing with God's people. Or in other cases, small secret sins left privately unrepented of Small matters of moral compromise take a ride into the slippery slope and magnify into significant and even shameful sins. And in an effort to avoid confrontation and accountability, the individual shies away from accountability that comes from meeting together with other professed Christ followers. Or it just be as simple as a spiritual lethargy. A person begins to rationalize that he or she can live out the faith individually and and independently without the tediousness and the extra emotional baggage that comes with being involved in the lives of others. Thus, he can justify in his heart, yes, I, I love Jesus, but the church I can live without. I don't need the church to thrive spiritually when I have my personal copy of the scriptures and the spirit who lives inside of me. I'm doing just fine on my own. The church, both universal and local, is arguably the most beautiful institutional creation God has ever formed. For qualification, when I say institutional creation, I don't mean the building or the organizational side of things. What I mean is the people. The church in its universal form is the redeemed of God in all places, in all times, since Acts 2. The local church is a geographically based gathering of those, the redeemed, who meet regularly to worship God and make disciples of Jesus. Yes, the church is messy. And yes, the church has an abundance of spiritual warts. Nevertheless, it is the means by which God accomplishes his will in the New Testament age. Jesus loves the church. Jesus saves his church. Jesus personally associates with his church. This is why when he appears to Saul on the road to Damascus, Jesus doesn't say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting the church? Saul was persecuting the church. Instead, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul was overseeing the death and the persecution of Christ's redeemed. And Jesus so associates with them that he himself is being persecuted when people persecute the church. The church has a significant purpose in God's marvelous plan of redemption. Now for you personally, 
what would be or what are the potential temptations or even personal circumstances that may cause you to devalue the church? Maybe you've even, maybe you've even gone through seasons where you haven't felt like being present. In other words, you could have done without the church. What were the factors that cultivated that mindset? Another question, maybe even at a more basic level, is do you even agree that the church and regularly meeting amongst her members is essential to the Christian walk? In part, I may be preaching to the choir because you've made it a point to come this morning. Your physical presence in this room signifies, at least for today, that you view the gathering, that is the present assembling of Christ's followers right here and right now, you view it with some spiritual significance or else you wouldn't be here. But even if you prioritize the Sunday morning gathering, I think today's word is a word we all need to hear. That's because followers of Christ need each other. And by design, we need the help of others to follow Christ. Humans are a communal people. Our God is a communal God. He lives in community via the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Christians in particular need other Christians to help them stay Christian. For this reason, I've entitled the sermon, Keeping the Faith Together. If you haven't done so already, I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Throughout our study in Hebrews, I've repeatedly emphasized the sermon-like nature of this literary piece. The sermons have particular elements that form their composition. And as one who has been trained in preaching and continually trying to grow in it, let me share with you three elements aspiring preachers are taught on how to construct their sermons. Three main components. Number one, explain the text. What is the text saying? What does it mean? Number two, illustrate the text. Humans often learn by analogy and through pictures and, and stories to make a point. And then number three, apply the text. How does the Lord want me to live in light of what the text says? Explain the text, illustrate the text, and apply the text. And if we're going to consider the, the sermon letter of Hebrews in a similar light, the author, in fact, has done the same thing. He's explained his theological concepts the main theological concept in Hebrews is Jesus is better. He's better than all the institutions of old handed down by Moses and his law. And furthermore, he's cited a lot of Old Testament passages and shown how they were fulfilled in Christ, explaining the text. He's also illustrated his theological concepts. He's repeatedly warned the Hebrew Christians not to fall away from Jesus Particularly in chapter 6, he utilizes the illustration of land receiving rain, yielding crops, and land receiving rain and producing thorns. Also in chapter 5 and 6, he talks about needing spiritual milk. That's a metaphor, that's an illustration. And finally, the author calls his audience to do something, to live in such a way based on these theological concepts that have been explained and illustrated. Not that there haven't been application points already, but today we come to the portion of the sermon letter where there's a heavier application, so to speak. And for the Hebrews, based on their position in Christ, what must be their practice? Because sometimes humans don't always connect the dots, and we need others to explicitly tell us what to do. Personally, I know, and I can often be dense going from theory to practice. Just ask Natalie. Often I need her to walk me step by step on what to do and what actions to take. A lot of things in life, actually. For instance, everyone knows that taking a kid to the doctor's office is for health purposes. Health is the overall umbrella. It's kind of the theoretical. But how do you find out about a child's health? What questions do you ask? And as sad as it sounds, sometimes Natalie needs to explicitly coach me on the things to ask and talk with about the doctor. Make sure you ask about his weight. 
don't forget to see what side effects this medication might have. You know, in my mind, the doctor's office is for promoting health, but often I need Natalie to connect the dots for me on how to achieve that goal if I'm the one on duty for doctor's visits. I think we have the same principle here with the author of Hebrews. Since we have someone who's opened the entryway to the heavenly places, as the author reminds us in 19 through 21, we need to actually take action, and here's how. Theological leads to practical. And so here's the main point of today's sermon. If we're going to cling to Jesus unto the end, we must commit to the church gathered. If we're going to cling to Jesus unto the end, we must commit to the church gathered. And in this snippet of seven verses of chapter 10, there are three explicit instructions that stand out. These three directives make make up the, the outline for the sermon today. The first two I'll be quite brief on, and then the third and final command I'll spend most of our time, as I understand it to be the kind of the linchpin for our whole section. So if you have the the bulletin, you can turn to the back page. The outline is listed for you. These are the three commands. Draw near, number one. Hold fast, number two. And stir up, number three. Draw near, hold fast, and stir up. Now, over the past couple of months, we spent a lot of time talking about sacrifices and and priesthood. We've covered the the superiority of Jesus' service and the superiority of Jesus' blood offering on behalf of his people over and against the institutions of the Old Testament. Now, he says, because of what we have in Christ, do these things. That's how he introduces the section. Look at verse 19 and following. He says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, point number one, draw near. Look there in verse 22. He continues and he says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. How is it that we are to draw near to God? The text says we draw near with full assurance of faith, with the heart sprinkled clean and with bodies washed with pure water. What that means is absent of shame, free of guilt, secure in our acceptance, we come before him. Our hearts abound with liberty when we're grounded in a knowledge of who Christ is and what he has done for us and what he is doing for us. Because of the finality of his sacrifice and the perpetual continuance of his priesthood, we come freely and we come openly. And our approach to the heavenly throne room can and must be marked by boldness and resounding joy. In our fallenness and ongoing battle with sin, It's commonplace. It's commonplace for us to approach the Lord with hesitancy and and sluggishness. Because we still sin, we approach him sheepishly, wondering whether or not he'll really accept us. And there seems to be a disconnect often of what we know is the theological truth. Yes, I know I'm forgiven in Christ and the actual willingness to approach him. How is it that we practically grow in a a willing readiness to draw near in the throne of grace. I hope to answer that directly in our third header with a strong emphasis from the, the communal aspect. But for now, suffice to say, we won't finish the Christian race unless we draw near to God with the attitude that he calls us to have. The irony is it's actually not really possible to draw near to God unless we truly take his promises heart. The person who questions God's ability to grant a clear conscience will not be able to draw near to God. We can't approach him with doubt. Why should we expect to actually enjoy him and the good things he offers, namely a sense of peace and joy, if we don't believe he can actually give it? And as Christians, the more we reflect on how he has made us clean, the more 
we will dwell upon his salvific work in our lives, the more we will be inclined to draw near to him. Moreover, we need to notice that the tension of a healthy assurance. When's the last time you engaged in self-reflection on the question of, how do I know I'm saved? How do I know I'm saved? In part, that's what the author is talking about, right? Again, he says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. What is explicit here is a call to faith. Yes, it's, it's on you to trust. Yes, it's, it's on you to believe. That's one side of the coin. But our assurance of being saved must never be grounded, ultimately grounded in our faith. It has to be grounded in the faithfulness of Christ. Even where we are unfaithful, he is faithful. That's why we can sing a song like, oh, come all ye unfaithful. That's what's assumed here. Christ has served as the perfect sacrifice. Christ continues to serve as the great high priest, the faithful high priest. Therefore, your assurance is tethered to what he has done. And the person who draws near to God regularly is the person who grasps the magnitude of what Christ has done and and who he is. Our drawing near shouldn't be ultimately grounded in the question, is my faith strong enough? Rather, our drawing near must be grounded in the eternal truth of Christ is better. Christ is sufficient. Christ is truly everything I need. With that in mind, be exhorted to draw near. On an individual and hopefully practical level, have you built in a regularity of drawing near to the Lord? The so-called spiritual disciplines are both basic and integral to the Christian life. It's really easy for us to substitute the corporate Bible intake, maybe the sermon or even in a smaller group Bible study. It's, It's easy for us to substitute that with what should be a daily approach in his word. And it's easy for us to replace the the need to individually seek the Lord with the corporate prayer or the the thought, you know, I, I do my prayer in small groups. Our pathway to the Lord is untrodden and unplotted when we do that. That is, we often fail to seek the Lord. And the idea of drawing near to the Lord is synonymous with seeking the Lord. Another pastor notes that the Hebrew idea for seeking here literally translates to trample underfoot. And the thought is, when you visit your neighbor, when you seek him or draw near to him, you actually trample under a foot, uh, excuse me, you trample underfoot a path to his house. Well, how well trodden is the pathway between us and the Lord? May we be a people who draw near to the Lord making well-worn paths because we can't get enough of him. Do you want to keep the faith? Well, then draw near to the Lord. But number two, second exhortation, second command, hold fast. Look there in verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. What does it mean to hold fast to the confession of our hope? Well, it means in context to continually and verbally profess your belief in Jesus. Don't hesitate to make a a verbal confession of what and whom you hold to. The confession of our hope likely refers to a a body of beliefs that he's, the author is calling them to stick to. And in context, the the confession of hope is, is simple. Jesus is Lord, Jesus is saves, and Jesus is better. He is the true priest king who effectively saves and mediates for his people. And the not so subtle implication is that what we believe and what we profess about Christ matters. The reason they need to hold fast is because someone is trying to pry them loose. The devil working through the temptations of the world is attempting to unfasten them to what and whom they should hold on to. And the the Hebrews were tempted to forget Christ and to return to the customs of old. Our temptation is different in the modern day church. Our temptation is to disregard our confession of hope, oftentimes because we don't want to be considered backwards, uncultured, 
and on the wrong side of history. Sometimes we're embarrassed of what other people will think of us based off, off of what we believe. And that embarrassment slowly erodes at our resolve and we begin to wonder, is it really worth it? Is it really worth associating with Jesus if these people are going to, to think me strange and backwards? We crave acceptance from the world more than we crave acceptance from the very living God himself. And the lure, the, the temptation, the draw of the world and being seen as friendly to it begins to take hold of us and we find ourselves more willing to compromise on this belief or that belief. And it happens at a, a slow and unnoticed pace. Drifting never happened overnight. This is why we must regularly examine, rehearse, and retell ourselves what we believe about Christ. And it must be done in community. But the true anchor that holds in place is Christ himself. For it says at the end of verse 23, he who promised is faithful. He who promised is faithful. Christ is the one who keeps us. We hold fast to our confession of hope because Jesus is ultimately doing the work. He is faithful to keep his promises. Listen to John chapter 6, verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. The rock solid truth is Jesus does not lose any of God's elect. Perseverance is possible for us because God is faithful. And on this principle of perseverance and holding fast, I'm reminded of a story in the Daily Bread devotional. Listen as I recount it for you. In 1952, Florence Chadwick attempted to swim 26 miles from the coast of California to Catalina Island. After 15 hours, a heavy fog began to block her view. She became disoriented and she gave up. And to her chagrin, Chadwick learned that she had quit just one mile short of her destination. Two months later, Chadwick tried a, a second time to swim to Catalina Island from the coast. Again, a thick fog settled in, but this time she reached her destination, becoming the first woman to swim the Catalina Channel. Chadwick said she kept an image of the shoreline in her mind, even when she couldn't see it. For us to hold fast, we must fasten in our minds and hearts that God is faithful. He is trustworthy. His promises are sure. Just like how Chadwick kept an image of the shoreline in her mind, we must continually hold fast to God's keeping, preserving character in our minds and in our hearts. And when we're settled in our hearts that his promises are sure, we will hold fast to the confession of our hope. Praise God for his faithfulness. Number one, draw near. Number two, hold fast. And finally, number three, in my estimation, the most important of these commands, stir up. Look with me in verse 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. I've got a lot of action words here. However, the main command is stir up. Well, stir up whom? Stir up one another. Well, stir up one another to what? To love and good works or good deeds. Love and good deeds or love and good works serve as the outward evidence that we indeed belong to Jesus. To stir up one another stands as one of the many so-called one another commands in scripture. And within the New Testament, you have, I think it's 59 one another commands. Love one another encourage one another, confess your sins to one another. These are the things that I'm talking about. Now, the obvious implication is that the one another commands must be obeyed in the context of community. You can't one another yourself. And in the context of Hebrews, 
in keeping our faith and staying faithful into the end, clinging to Jesus is a communal project. Again, consider 24 and 25. He says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And to proclaim it outright, we cannot expect to finish the race without actively being a part of the body of Christ. That is, we cannot neglect gathering together for corporate worship and think we will cross the finish line of the Christian faith, of the Christian race. Those who make it to heaven will be those who did not neglect to meet together amongst other followers of Christ on a regular and habitual basis. The direct translation of the beginning of verse 25 in the ESV could be rendered, do not forsake the assembly Do not forsake the assembly of yourselves. Now that Greek word translated meet together or assembly of yourselves references the communal gathering of God's people. In the New Testament, when did they meet? On the first day of the week for Resurrection Sunday. And that's what we're doing right here at this very moment. I will note that the language of assembly is physical, Meeting or assembling together is not simultaneously logging into some online forum, listening to sermons together on YouTube. Assembling together is not having an online Zoom Bible study with a few members of the church. There's an inherently physical aspect to it. We are embodied souls in a given space and time. Furthermore, I would add that the assembly referenced here, the the not neglecting to meet together, is in the context of the local church as a congregation. We're not talking about small groups, not a one-on-one discipleship meetup, not a clay or EAF dinner, not a Sunday school class. Instead, I'd argue the author highlights the corporate church gathered. That is the individual members of the church assembling together in the name of Christ. I would argue our ability to stir one another up through corporate worship is intended by God to be a highlight of the week. It's the one day of the week where we experience the Lord's presence uniquely as he designed it. Gunnar Gunderson, a former fellow seminarian of mine from Kentucky, says this, On Sunday morning, the temple of God gathers for worship. On Monday morning, the temple of God scatters for mission. I think that's a great quote. Again, on Sunday morning, the temple of God, where God dwells among us, gathers for worship. On Monday morning, the temple of God spreads for mission. There's a uniqueness about our assembling that is absent from other things Christians do. We will not be stirred up to love and good deeds, and we will not spread for mission and actually do what he says unless we are in a regular and consistent posture of gathering. Growth will be inhibited without gathering. You may have heard the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. There's elements of truth to that statement. It obviously needs a lot of qualification. But playing off that sentiment... I would say it takes a church, it takes an assembly of Christ followers, that is, to disciple and raise a spiritual child. Now, are Christians just discipled in the worship gathering? No, discipleship happens outside of this gathering for sure. But I fear that people don't even think of the public gathering as the primary place of discipleship. I'd argue that it is, and indispensably so. I'd even take it a step further to say that to completely neglect the gathering is not only detrimental to one's soul, it is sinful. And in my estimation, the the broader evangelical church has devalued the primacy of the Lord's day gathering. Now, as I'm making a case for the indispensable nature of the worship assembling, I can hear the voice of reasoning saying, you know, what about such and such situation? I do not deny there are particular circumstances that prevent genuine Christians from meeting together in this context without sharing what I personally think are legitimate versus illegitimate excuses. Yes, there are 
understandable reasons. But sometimes we default to those for ourselves or for others in order to be sensitive. I get that. But the reality is, clinging to Jesus, staying faithful to him, requires being a part of a community. We must be very careful to excuse ourselves from assembling together. And clinging to Jesus is, again, a communal project. We help each other to finish the race. By the way, the the other two commands of drawing near and holding fast are in the context of community as well. Each of those commands is written in the first person plural. He says, Hebrews, we must draw near to God. He says, Hebrews, we must collectively hold fast to the confession of our hope. And throughout this passage, the author of Hebrews is saying, just like how one member in our congregation here often says, we're in this together. And in order to illustrate this point, that clinging to Jesus is a community project, Take a moment to think in your mind about someone you know personally who once professed Christ, but no longer. If you know them well enough and examine their life, what would you say about their church attendance and commitments to both the corporate gathering and relationships within that gathering? I guarantee, amongst other factors, sliding away from the local church will be a significant factor for that person's departure. Of course, a buffet of explanations could be given on why they left a particular local church, but it doesn't change the reality that they left the community that God has purposed to help them stay on the straight and narrow. And it's heartbreaking when people leave the church. And I'm not alluding to leaving one Bible-believing church for another. I'm saying leaving the church altogether. I could list scores of individuals who were professed faithful followers of Christ who I know personally in college, actively serving, super involved, who will not be found within the four walls of a church building today. Absolutely breaks my heart. And it was a temptation 2,000 years ago for the Hebrews, and it's a temptation for us today. Again, verse 25, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. And the recipients of this letter, of this sermon letter, probably could have named names of people who had drifted away. We must stay tethered to God's people expressed communally. And church membership and church attendance and and involvement with it doesn't save us, but it is God's appointed means, God's appointed means to see us through to the end. By the way, this is not to ignore the reality that in a fallen world, even the church does have its problems, so much so that it can turn people off from being a part of it. We talked about some of the reasons people abandon the church at the beginning. I'd say that spiritual abuse where a a leadership hypocritically oversteps its biblical authority is often one of the reasons many have left the church. But spiritual abuse in one church is not an excuse to abandon the church altogether. I know a Christian individual who suffered significant spiritual abuse in church for years. And the pastor craftily manipulated and guilt-tripped this believer into following his quote-unquote brand of Christianity for many years. However, when this individual finally came to his senses, he realized he had to leave that particular church. Then years later, this disciple of Christ still follows Jesus in the context of a local church. And I remember him saying to me, despite my experience, I just couldn't leave the church altogether because there's something so different about it than every other human institution. God is at work in the bride of Christ. And from my understanding, that was his way of saying, I will not neglect meeting together. And he understood his spiritual survival depended on the church, and not turning his back on it after even what happened. And to my knowledge, he continues as a member of a Bible-believing church today. If you're not supposed to neglect the assembly, what is it about the assembly that helps us to cling to Jesus? What is it about this gathering? Well, our assembling provides the encouragement we need to continue on in the faith. 
Again, look at 25. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. When we worship together, what we're essentially saying to one another is, keep following Christ. Keep following Christ. This is worth my time, and this is worth your time, and we're helping each other prepare for the day when Jesus returns. When we all bear the responsibility of bringing out the best of one another, things are as God wants it to be. Do you find encouragement in the assembly of your spiritual family members? It's easy to become discouraged out in the world. I hope you find encouragement amongst your fellow spiritual members, even in the here and the now. And if I may, allow me to share some of the reasons why I personally am encouraged to worship with you. I have the unique privilege of standing up here and and addressing you, but I also operate with a, a general knowledge of maybe some of the things that are going on in your lives. Not every single detail, but just generally. And it's truly a special thing when we gather. Because this is the place where a four-year-old, even though she doesn't know a lot, can visually witness and observe a 70-something-year-old singing unto the Lord. This is the place where a single brother can worship alongside a widow who lost her husband and still see her rejoicing. This is the place where a high school-aged believer can learn more about Christ right next to someone 30 years his senior. This is the place where every member can join in on prayer, even though it might be just one person leading the prayer. This is the place where we can all hear together and say amen in our hearts because culturally we're not used, used to saying amen out loud. And this is the place where a brother or sister battling cancer or other health issues is able to pray with a fellow member who is grieving the loss of a loved one. This is the shared space where we all share our unity in Christ despite our diversity. Just by being together, focusing on the things of God, we're telling one another, keep the faith, brother. We're telling one another, keep the faith, sister. But also, encouragement is not passive in the sense of just being together. It's also active. We're to speak words to one another, words that apply the scripture to each other's lives. There are a couple of implications with that. As an extension of this gathering, we even continue to share life with one another. As an extension of this local church, we meet for coffee or lunch, or in someone's home for relationship building. If we're going to encourage one another, we must know the word well enough to number one, we, excuse me, we must know the word well enough, number one, and number two, we must know each other well enough to encourage. And our interactions must be marked by a level of vulnerability if we're going to help one another. We grow in being open and we grow in boldness to speak helpful scripture-informed words. What all this means is that Contrary to Cain's attitude, yes, we are our brother's keeper. Yes, we are responsible to care for one another. And not all the time, but sometimes the temptation is to think, let the pastor, let the pastor follow up with so-and-so. But that's not how God intended the body of Christ to function. We are members of one another. So if you see someone dropping off the radar, someone scarcely seen here on a Sunday morning, you are, we are, all called to pursue that individual. Are there people you know who haven't been around? Well, check in on them. Encourage them. Tell them the body is incomplete without its members. For those of you who are here today and who are here regularly, here's an additional challenge. Consider deliberately planning, arranging, and organizing your weeks and months so that you can be present with God's people on the Lord's day. Does that mean you don't travel? Not at all. But make an effort to worship with another local church on the Lord's day when you are out of town. On a different note, and I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but I'll say it anyway, make an effort to be here for the entirety of the service. 
We have a set amount of time together. It's not a big chunk of time. Make an effort to be here for the entirety of our time from call to worship all the way to benediction. And I, I'm not going to be keeping a record of when you get here and neither do I want other members to do that. But I do want all of us to prioritize the gathering. It's one of the primary means by which God keeps us clinging to him. A former co-seminarian of mine has been quoted as saying, spiritual disciplines are not about making you more precious to God. They're about making God more precious to you. He's saying, we do not earn merit by doing our disciplines of Bible reading and prayer. Instead, we gain a greater view of God by our disciplines. Well, the same goes for the gathering. It's as another person said, has said, we don't gather with the church to make ourselves precious to God. We gather because as we're reminded of the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection, as we're encouraged by the family for whom he died, God becomes more precious to us. And my prayer for you and my prayer for, for me is that we would have God become more precious to us, more precious because we have other people who are both directly and indirectly telling us he is precious. And hopefully those people are in this room. Do you love Jesus? Then you will also love his church. Let's pray. Father, you have used many metaphors to describe your people. She is a bride. She is a temple. And Father, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die for this bride. And we thank you for the opportunity to be that very temple that as when we gather together, God is present amongst us. And so we thank you for this corporate discipline, this corporate means of grace that you use in our lives to hold us fast. Oh, how good it is to be with your people. Thank you even for this morning, this particular gathering of saints. I pray that you would continue to bless us with your presence and help us to commit to one another relationships that enable us to spur one another on to love and good deeds. Thank you for the freedom that we have to gather in the name of Christ to worship you, the one true and living God. We also continue in worship, thanking you for the opportunity to give in uh, finances and, and resources. We pray that you would bless that the offering of your people, that the work of the gospel might be able to continue on because of the giving of your people. Thank you, Lord, for your generous faithfulness to us. Help us to be generous with what you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.